All right, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel 10. I gave you a smaller handout today, um, uh, I, and it's only because I had fairly well exhausted all of the stuff I wanted to give you from Daniel. I thought that we were going to be able to be finished in three sessions, and lo and behold, here we are in session four. And so uh, we're going to finish today, whether we finish or not, <laughs> I, we need to move on. This is just a survey, but the book of Daniel is so significant in our understanding of um, end times, uh, so significant in our understanding of prophecy that we needed to uh, spend a little extra time, it seems. So uh, Daniel chapter 10, I'm going to read uh, the first nine verses, and then we'll just, we'll just go through. Well, actually, we're going to go back. I'm going to put you in context with the book, and then we'll talk a little bit about chapter 9, and then we'll get our running start in the 10, 11, and 12. So uh, beginning in verse 1, Daniel chapter 10, God's Word says this. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the message was true and one of great conflict, but he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed." On the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Euphaz. His body also was like beryl, his face had the appearance of lightning, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. All right, so this is the introduction to the last vision, this final vision, and it really is a, a unit of, of um, a unit of Scripture, 10, 11, and 12, all one vision. The vision is actually in chapter 11. Chapter 10 is the uh, preparation for the vision, and then chapter 12 is the instruction to Daniel on what to do uh, once, once it was finished. So we'll get to all that, but I just want you to understand what we were reading uh, right there. And by the way, who is this man in linen? Uh, yeah, so uh, there's a dispute among the scholars about who this man in linen is, but if you read the description, it's the same description that we have of Jesus in the book of Revelation. It's the same description that we have of the Son of Man in Ezekiel. I truly believe this is, this is Jesus, a face like lightning. Um, those, are, those are descriptions uh, of the Lord. And so then in, ver in, I mean, in verse 10, a hand touched me. This is a different personage. This is an angel in verse 10, um, because then we're reintroduced to the man of, in linen later, and so um, there's a distinction between the two. But we'll get to all that. I just wanted to, as we read it, uh, it reminded me again to make that point. So uh, the general outline to the book of Daniel, uh, we, we've skipped a week. We've been three weeks in it. It's been a month now since I introduced you to the book of Daniel. And so I just want to refresh you as we, we skipped two weeks. We skipped two weeks, and so it's been, a, it's been a day since we've done this. So um, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel is all about uh, Daniel and the kings of Babylon and Persia. So it's really God takes Daniel from Jerusalem, from Judah, to Babylon and uses him there. He's an influencer, to use a modern-day word. Uh, he is there in, um, in Babylon almost well, not almost. He is God's representative there to ensure that God's um, program and people are, are, are moved forward. He, he's doing what God has called him to do. And so the first six chapters are really all about that. Uh, Daniel's personal history in chapter 1, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had that Daniel 
both told what the dream was and interpreted in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's golden image in chapter 3, uh, the, tr the dream of the tree and Nebuchadnezzar uh, being struck with madness and then brought back uh, in chapter 4, Belshazzar's feast, the writing on the wall in chapter 5, and then Daniel in the lion's den in chapter 6. Now those, all of those were spread out. Um, Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, probably, well, grandson, so there's distance there. And then Daniel and Lions then took place with Darius, the king. So long, long time. Daniel was an older man there. And so that traversed all of Daniel's life. Uh, and then the second portion of Daniel is, are the visions of Daniel, chapter 7 through 12. We saw the vision of the four beasts, uh, and then the vision of the ram and the goat in chapter 8, the vision of the 70 weeks in chapter 9. I'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, again, we talked about it last three weeks ago. And then the final vision is what we'll focus on today. And so these are visions, but these visions also traverse Daniel's life. They weren't all at the end, or they weren't all in one period of time. They also um, went throughout. And you'll remember the, the four beasts, I just want to remind you because we're going to see that again today. The four beasts are the four kingdoms, um, the same kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw. So Babylon, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans, the four beasts. Um, Antiochus, this uh, the, this last horn that came out the, uh, is Antiochus the um, fourth. You'll remember that the the Greek Empire broke up after Alexander into four into four sections, um, and there and so some of those were the Macedon, which is what we call European uh, Greece, and then Asia was its own kingdom that came out of Greece. Um, Alexandria, uh, the Ptolemy uh, part of Greece down in uh, Africa, North Africa, and then over in the Middle East, what we'd call the Middle East today, or Palestine, Israel area, um, Mesopotamia, whatever you want to call that area. The, um, <laughs> there's so many political things tied to every word that I just used that that's why I just kept going. I mean, there are all just all these things. But um, that section, the Seleucid Empire, is where Antiochus came from. And, uh, and that's, that's what we're going to see some today as well. Have I lost anybody? Everybody with me? That was all a review. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. You probably have this already. You have that one already? Okay. So, this is, this is what we did the last time. And let me just, this is chapter 9. Chapter 9 is perhaps the most disputed, at the end of chapter 9, perhaps the most disputed part of prophecy, because it's from there that everybody goes their separate ways in what they believe about the end times. It really is the end of Daniel 9 that, uh, that, that brings it about. In fact, it starts in verse 24 of chapter 9. Seventy weeks have been dec decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, I'll just tell you, that shouldn't be disputed. Verse 24, that is Jesus. Jesus did those things on the cross at Calvary. So, so uh, but as we all know, it's not completely completed. Right? Y'all get that. I mean, it, it has been done. Jesus said it is finished, it was done. But now it's playing out until the end. Um, it's why I suggest, or it's why I believe, that the day of the Lord began with Jesus and will end with Jesus, and it's this whole period of his, of his earthly ministry, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his coming. I believe all that is the same, um, uh, the same day even though it's more than a day, obviously. Uh, but that, it's just, that's the only way that I can make all of these prophecies about the day of the Lord make sense. Um, if you remember, Joel prophesied about the day of the Lord, 
and then Peter on the day of Pentecost walks up and says it's been fulfilled in your uh, today well that's the day of the Lord being fulfilled so something had to, you, so th it's just the way that I I figured out you put it all together is it started with Jesus and ended with Jesus Jesus's whole ministry will not finish until he comes back puts his feet on the earth and rules okay so all of that I believe is just one event especially from the Old Testament have I lost anybody yet now you may say pastor I don't believe that I believe something else that's fine if if your favorite Bible teacher teaches it a different way then that's I'm okay with that <laughs> that's groovy uh, I'm all right with that but it's but all the other interpretations have questions that cannot be answered by their interpretation and so I've tried to take make an interpretation that answers all of those questions and that's the way I've done it um, uh, if if you say that the day of the Lord has not yet happened, then Peter didn't know what he was talking about in Acts 2. Well, that just can't be. I mean, obviously, he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he did that, so that has to be true. But if, if it was just a day, the day of Pentecost, then there's nothing else to look forward to. Well, that can't be true, and so that's the way I dealt with it. Everybody with me? All right, good. All right, so... Um, so these 69 sevens from Cyrus's decree until the Messiah, these sevens are, are years, weeks of years. And it's true, if you, depending on the way that you count it from Cyrus's de decree, you have 69 times seven years to Jesus's arrival. And so it, it fits in that time. The problem is with the 70th seven, that last seven, when did that take place? How did it take place? And so if you read on in verse 25, so you are, are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So that's 69. So there's no question about that. But it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. That's Jerusalem will be. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And then verse 27, and he will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of the abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So, the question then is, is that he, in verse 27, and he will make a firm covenant, is it the evil prince that's to come, or is it Jesus? Now, you can imagine those are quite two different things. You don't just miss it by a little bit if you say it's either Jesus or who we call the Antichrist. Um, those can't be the same person, and they can't accomplish the same thing. And so that's where the diversion comes, or the divergence comes, in, uh, in the way that you interpret, really, the rest of the end times prophecy comes right there with the way that you interpret that verse. Uh, so, there are some people who would say that it's Jesus who makes the firm covenant with the many. Um, he put a, a stop to sacrifice and offering in a good way. He was the final sacrifice. And so, and then there's, there's the, uh, the one comes and makes desolate, and then, it'll be, and then it'll be done. The other way to read it is the one who makes desolate is the one who makes the covenant. And so, uh, this covenant would be the, uh, the, the interpretation is that there's a covenant between the Antichrist and Jews for three and a half years, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, and then, um, and that's when the wrath of God is poured out during the tribulation. This is the way that most people I would suggest in this room have heard it, if not believe it that way. Um, and so, uh, two different, completely different things, and it leads to different answers uh, down, down the road. Any, any questions about that? We talked about it a little bit. That's that final question, parenthesis or not. So, for those who believe that the 77s, or for those who believe that there was a stop at the end of the 69 sevens, 
they believe that we're living in a, a parenthesis right now, and then when the tribulation comes, that 70th seven will come. So 69 sevens, nothing's happened for a long, long time, and then there'll be a 70th seven, and that 70th seven is the seven years of tribulation. The, that's that interpretation. The other interpretation is that the 77s ended um, at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD after Jesus's ministry there. Does that make sense? All right. The, the problem with that interpretation, and there is one, is that you have 69 sevens that are literally seven years, and then you have a 70th seven that's not literal, but it, it stretches from Jesus' resurrection to 70 AD, about 40 years. And so that's the problem with that one. Um, the, the problem with the other is it puts a stop to the 77s when there, there isn't one, uh, at least not written into the Word. Everybody good? I know what you're thinking. Jim, which is it? I don't know. If I knew, I would have told you from the beginning and we'd have been all right. Uh, I'm just telling you, this is, this is the, these are the two ways to look at this verse, and it's very difficult. It depends on who you, who you read and what you read and then what you believe and those kinds of things on how this is interpreted. The Bible is just not crystal clear right here on this. All right. But what we do know is we know that this vision in, in chapter 9 was given as a promise to Daniel. Daniel, don't worry. I've got this under control. I told you you're going to be here for 70 years, and now you're going to see it start, start unfolding. And so we have, uh, we, we have this program of God working things out. So that's what happens in chapter 9. If there aren't any questions, I'm going to move on to chapter 10. All right, here we go. So, you know what? I'm going to do this for you because I know you're going to ask me to do it. So there you go. That's the rest of today. So Daniel is given a final vision in chapter 11, but it really starts, the, the, the story of this final vision starts in chapter 10. This is the longest unit in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, 11, and 12. The rest of Daniel is limited chapter by chapter. And so he, it, one chapter is one unit. So here we have this final vision in three chapters. We have the preparation for the final vision. Daniel is mourning for three weeks. Now we're not told exactly what it is, but, but the, the supposition is that he's mourning because work has ceased on the temple back in Jerusalem. So that means Daniel's an old man now. Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, have already gone back. Uh, Nehemiah has gone back. Uh, they've built the walls. They're building the—you remember they built the walls. They cleared off the platform. This is all in the book of Haggai that I'm, that I'm now telling you about, which we'll get to. Um, and then they stopped work. They went to work on their own houses. They went to do their own stuff. They stopped work on the temple. And so it's supposed that Daniel is mourning the fact that they are, um, uh, that they've stopped work. He, he's, it, it's grieved his spirit. Now you may ask this question, I don't have an answer for it, but you may ask this question, why didn't Daniel go back to Jerusalem with everybody else? There, there may be several reasons for that. One, it's possible that he is too old to make the trip. Um, he would be in his 70s or 80s, and uh, they didn't have an Amtrak train or a um, you know, supersonic jetliner to take him there. He would have had to walk or ride, and it may have just been too much for him to do um, on the trip back. It's also possible that God, well, obviously this is the truth. God's plan was for him to stay in, in Babylon, that he was God's representative there in Babylon for those who were still there. And obviously there were those around him because they were together there around the river when he got this vision. And so um, it's quite possible that 
Well, it's, it's certain that God wasn't finished with him. It's also possible, it reminds me, and I'm not saying this is, I'm, I'm not saying there's any truth. It just, it just clicks in my mind. It's not completely exactly the same because Moses had sinned and that we don't see that in Daniel's life. But it's possible that he's a modern day, he's a modern day Moses. He did all the preparation work for the people to go back and, and then God let somebody else lead them back in. Um, I've not ever read any other scholar that said that. I just, that's what it reminds me of. It, it sounds like Moses taking them right up to the point and then not being able to go in. And it seems like Daniel, Daniel was worried. Daniel was concerned. Daniel was praying. And we see his prayers answered. All of this stuff in Daniel's life. And yet he's not able to go back and, and participate in it there. Um, there's, in my thinking with that, I don't know how to say this without being weird, but in my thinking on that, it seems like we're all about unfinished business until it's finished, until, until the end. Like we, we all have, like none of us are going to be completely satisfied in our life until we're with the Lord Jesus for eternity. Right? So, because that's what we were created for. So it, in some ways, it just seems like with Moses and with Joshua, you remember Joshua went into the promised land, but he never saw it completely subdued. So Joshua with the disciples, they never saw what we saw, the expansion of, of the kingdom light to this end. With Daniel, he didn't get to go back and see. So in, in my mind, and even in Revelation, where there are people in heaven, the, the, uh, those who were martyred, who were there in chapter 6, the fifth seal, and they're saying, how long, O Lord? How long? When is this going to be finished? And so there just seems to be part of the human condition that is waiting, that's not going to be satisfied until the resurrection of the body, until Jesus comes back and puts us all back. Does that make sense? I know that's weird, but that's just the way my mind works when I read Scripture, and it answers so many things in my own life. Why can't I do this? Well, because you weren't meant to do that. That's not part of your experience here. So I, I just say all that. That's probably why Daniel is still there in, uh, in Babylon. Was there something that he's doing there? He dies in Babylon. Um, but I'm telling you, the next breath he breathed was in the new Jerusalem <laughs> or in the new heavens or however you want to put it. Um, and, and so maybe not the new heavens, but he's in heaven with, with the Lord. And so he, he's satisfied. He, he sees what he was supposed to see now. So we have him there by the river, Tigris. Now we're in chapter 10, Tigris. Um, and he has this vision of, I believe the Lord. Now, not all scholars believe that. There are some who say, well, no, this is just another angel. But uh, I really think that this is um, a, a, the pre-incarnate Christ that he sees. Verse 10, then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. All right, that's weird. All right, so um, let me just talk to you a minute about angels and demons and the best that I can tell you. All right, the best that I understand. In fact, this passage in Daniel and then a passage in the book of Jude and then the book of Revelation are really the extent of us seeing some kind of battle between angelic beings. So let me talk to you for a minute about angelic beings. First, angelic beings are created beings. They are not gods. They are not God, which means they are not omniscient. 
They are not omnipresent, and they are not omnipotent. So angels are created. They are very, very powerful, but they are not strong. They are not all powerful. They are smart, intelligent, but they are not all intelligent. I believe it's impossible for a demon or Satan himself to read your mind. Y'all hear me, okay? He, he's not God. That's something God does. That's not something Satan does. I do believe that humans are predictable. So I believe that the enemy... Satan, or and, and Satan's not omniscient, so I don't believe Satan can be everywhere at once. I'm sure, I'm almost positive that there's not a person in this room who's ever had a personal encounter or visitation by Satan himself. We're just not that worthy. <laughs> you know, and I don't mean that bad, but I, uh, or weird. I just mean that he's got bigger fish to fry. I mean, he, he was tempting Jesus. He's not out here messing with us, but he's got demons that do that. All right, are y'all with me? Uh, I know this is different. The devil made me to no, know. You probably never came in contact with the devil. I, I haven't either. But one of his demons, one of his angels, certainly so. So he has, he has angels. He is an angel. He had angels that followed him out of heaven. In fact, reading in Revelation chapter 12, he has angels that fought with him in heaven and then were kicked out of heaven with him. So when he was cast to earth, they were cast out too. Everybody with me still? Okay. So, um, and oh, I said humans are predictable. So the way that they mess with us is they, they tempt us with one of several things. Um, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, anything that fits into those categories. And then when they find out what works for you, guess what they do? They keep doing it. So, <laughs> that's right. So, so it doesn't take a mind reader. I mean, listen, your two-year-old did that to you. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they found out what worked, and then they did it. And so it's not, it, it doesn't, we're not talking about omniscience. They're all powerful. Or om, they're not gods. But they are real, and they obviously do battle. And so it's interesting here God sends his messenger, possibly in this case, Gabriel. Um, he's mentioned by name earlier in, in chapter 9. He's not mentioned by name here in chapter 10, verse 10. But it's possible that this is him again. But a messenger, oh, I meant to say that. So angels, I'm, I'm messing everything up. No, I'm not. I'm just messing your minds up. So angels are God's messengers, they, God sends them to do work. Now, here's a question that I don't think anybody can answer. But are angels a race or are angels a company? And let me tell you what that means. That means are all angels exactly alike in the sense that there's a race of angelic beings and they're all the same types of beings? Or are there multiple types of angels, multiple races, if you will, of, of beings? And when he talks about the host of heaven, it's a company. It's a, it's a military unit. It's a, it's a gathering of all these differences. Um, I don't think that we, we do. There are some differences. Obviously, the Bible uses the word cherubim and seraphim. Um, cherubim means the faced ones, the ones with faces. Uh, seraphim means the burning ones, uh, those who are on fire. They may be the same ones and just use different words, different places, or they may be different ones. Nobody really knows. I'm, I'm now talking about lots of speculation because the Bible, I mean, you've read the Bible. You know how much it talks about angels and demons. It assumes their presence. It talks a little bit about them. This is the extent of their discussion. Uh, they, really in the, all the Bible as we see them in action like this. We see Gabriel going um, to Mary and Joseph. We see the angels at the tomb. 
um, where the, the stone's been rolled away. We see an angel take Peter out of the prison, lead him out of the prison. We, we are told in Hebrews that we ought to be hospitable to others because we may entertain angels. Um, but remember, angels is a generic term also and can mean messenger. So in that case, it may be just somebody who is a messenger of the Lord. It may be a human that's an angel in that, in that verse because an angel just means messenger. So it, it starts to get difficult to understand exactly or have a theology about angels. And then we get to Jude where it talks about um, Michael not bringing a railing accusation against uh, against Satan, but saying, um, what's he say? I thought I had it. The Lord, oh, the Lord rebuke you. That's it. So the Lord rebuke you. And then in Revelation, we see angels. We have human angels in chapters two and three of, of Revelation, where to the angel at the church of Laodicea or wherever, I believe those are the pastors there, and, but they're messengers of God there. And then, um, and then we see angels doing God's work throughout the book of Revelation. So that's really, oh, I didn't tell you, the angels we see in Isaiah around the throne, the angels in Ezekiel, and the angels, the seraphim that uh, ran or guarded the Garden of Eden as Adam and Eve uh, were expelled. That's it, y'all. I just told you everything the Bible says about angels. So... Yeah, I get there. I get there. So hang on to that question. He asked about archangels. I'll get to that in just a minute. So, um, well, I'll, I'll get there now. Now's a good time. So, just like humans, angels have an order. Uh, there are some who are in charge. Uh, here we read Michael, who is one, it says, one of the princes of the angels. Um, he is called the prince of angels. He is the only one, uh, to my knowledge, that is called the arc, an archangel. Um, there, there, is, there is thought, teaching, that didn't come from me, but that predated me a long time. There is teaching that says that the four archangels were Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer, and Raphael. That's not in the Bible, y'all. Right? Okay, so um, there are other places that people have presumed that, but that's not biblical. And so the only one that's called an archangel in the Bible is Michael. Put Michael aside for just a second, because I'm going to come back to him. And, and then... So, what we have here in verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. It seems like, I mean, that the prince of Persia is a demon that did actual battle with this angel that came to... to bring the news to Daniel. I don't know what to make of that. But that's what it says. So I have to account for it. I just don't know. I, you, you're going to ask me, so a demon can thwart an angel? Three weeks he did, 21 days. I don't know. I, I, there's, there's lots of speculation. Lots of people have talked. Lots of people have built whole, whole theologies around this. But you, you can read it as good as I can. This is what it says. And so it seems like there are territorial demons, um, at least demons that are assigned. Uh, if, there's a, if there are archangels in, um, in, in, God's, in, in God's company of angels, then there may be archangels in um, Satan's company of followers. And, and that this prince of Persia is one of those leaders of other, of other demonic, evil, wicked angels. Um, does that make sense? What are your questions? I have written in my Bible, I don't think it was for you, but um, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was, and I have Satan written in there. Yeah, um, 
there are, uh, yeah, there would be people who would think that that is Satan himself. Um, John Calvin thought that it was an actual king in Persia. It was actually a Persian king, but how a human can withstand an angel, that's, that's foreign too. So I think Calvin is wrong on that. Uh, most everybody today would say that it's a demonic force, whether it's Satan himself or not. We don't, we, there's no way to know. I mean, people, people can say a lot of things, but there's no way really to know. The Bible doesn't say that. Um, but I would, I would believe that this is a demonic being, and it may be Satan. It may be the enemy, Satan, the accuser, but, um, you know, the one called Lucifer. But I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't have that answer. So I would not have said that <laughs> because I don't know. I, I don't know that. Yeah, it may have been. And it's not, it's not necessarily wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying you can't be certain. It doesn't say that. Yes, ma'am. Miss Jane? Yeah, um, I, I've not heard it that way. Um, it's, I, I get anything. So when we start talking about this, anything is possible when we start trying to figure this out because the words are just what they are. They just are what they are. I believe that, it, I believe that the, the man in linen in verses uh, five, and, 5 to 9 are, are pre-incarnate Christ, but I believe in verse 10 is a different angel because pre-incarnate Christ has no weakness. All right, so I know it's hard to say that Jesus is weak, so just follow me on this. But, but when Jesus took on human flesh at, the, at, at, well, at Christmas, at the incarnation, when God became a man, he surrendered or he yielded himself to be limited in our, in this, what some people call a flesh suit, <laughs> you know, in this, this, this thing that we're wearing. And so, Je but, and, but Jesus didn't just wear it, Jesus was it. So Jesus, fully God, fully man. But it was only then, Miss Jane, that I would say that, that Jesus became, took on the frailties of our, of our flesh. I don't think Jesus, I don't think, I don't think anybody, Satan or anybody, could withstand Jesus before he became human. Um, uh, we're talking about a lot of presuppositions, but uh, I mean, he who spoke the worlds into existence is also the one who spoke Satan into existence. And so I don't think, I, I, I just, that sounds to me more mythological than it does biblical, although I don't mean that in any negative way, Miss Jane. I'm not, that, that's not negative, but that's what it sounds like to me. Um, this idea that Jesus and Satan are somehow equal and fighting, and that's not, that's not true. I know you, oh, I know you don't. Yeah. Right. Sure. Oh, I understand. And, and I'm sure it's not just your conception. I'm sure that there are others who have, uh, I just, when we start talking, about, so uh, I don't mean to pick on anybody. I, I really try hard not to pick on any, anybody's theology at all, especially when it's not clear. But Roman Catholicism has made a, a heyday of developing these stories about angels that just aren't backed up by Scripture. And so that's the only, that's the only reason why I'm careful about what I say, is you, we just have to be very careful not to, not to stray from what the Word says. Right. <laughs> right, right. Right. Well, uh, right. And I'm not trying to refute you. I'm just, uh, I just. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, J I, I forgot, Jacob didn't wrestle with, I don't think he wrestled with an angel. I think he wrestled with God because he named the place Peniel, the face of God. And, uh, and so uh, she asked about Jacob wrestling with an angel. I don't think, he did see, uh, that's right, that's another one. He did see the angels ascending and descending, but John says he saw Jesus in, in, at that ladder. So the, so that the, the ladder at Bethel was a, was a, a, a symbolic image of Jesus, this, this ladder to heaven, Jacob's ladder. And then when he wrestled, I believe he was wrestling with Jesus himself and Jesus touched him and he walked with a limp ever since. Your daughter walks with a limp because of that. <laughs> she, <laughs> she'll tell you that. She, uh, that, that's one of her favorite. She says, I wrestled with God and he touched me and I got a limp. <laughs> so so uh, anyway, uh, but um, so let's, re let's talk about Michael for just a second. There are those who believe that Michael is pre-incarnate Christ. I've put a section of Scripture, I mean, a, a passage from a book on the handout that talks about this a little bit. One of the great Baptist theologians of 400 years ago was um, a guy by the name of John Gill. And John Gill thought that. My, my seminary president, Dr. Allison, thought that. Orthodox Christians who believe that, those two I just mentioned and others, do not believe this the same way that the Jehovah's Witnesses believe it. So the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus and Michael are the same person, but they believe that Jesus is a created being, which is certainly false. Jesus is not created being. So if I were to believe this about Michael, I would believe not that he's a created angel, but not that Jesus is Michael, but that Michael is Jesus, if you take it that, if you look at it that way, that, that Michael is, and, and the reason is, listen to the words that are said about him. He is the archangel. You know what the word arch means? Leader of, leader of. It's not, it, it is rank, but it's, you could have all kinds of arch I mentioned to somebody just this last week, I used it in an illustration, the Asiarchs in Acts, Asiarchs. It's the ruler of the Asians. You could be an Asiarch and not be an Asian. I think you can be an archangel and not be an angel. You see what I mean? I think, I think the ruler of the angels is what archangel means, not necessarily another form of angel. So if I, you can tell, I, I've, I've done a lot of reading about Michael, and I could be convinced. Because just listen to what it says about him. Um, Michael, one of the chief princes, this says one of the chief princes, it, it could be, in fact, let me, I, I don't have it, let, let me have that paper I gave to you. I'll give it right back, I promise. So listen, his name means who is like God. He's described as one of the chief princes, your prince, the great prince, the protector of your people, the, the, the archangel, the highest angel, the first angel, who contends against these princes. I would be really, really easily convinced with John Gill and with Dr. Gray Allison that that's, that's who this person is. In, in 1 Thessalonians 4, and I'm not trying to convince you by any means. It, I, I may be wrong on this, so I am not. I'm just throwing this out to say that this is not necessarily unorthodox, that this is, this, it can fit into who we believe that Jesus is. I've already told you, I've been, I've been telling you since the beginning that I believe that the angel of the Lord is pre-incarnate Christ. And this would be the angel of the Lord, the, the messenger of the Lord, the one who represents the Lord. I in no means, no, we don't, if anybody ever says this, I'm going to call you a liar to your face. I do not believe that Jesus is a created being. He is God. He has been, always been. He is not created. He is God. He was with God and he was God. He's the creator of all things. Jesus is the first I mean, so I do not, 
in any stretch. Everybody got me. I don't have to say it anymore. I do not believe Jesus was created. But it wouldn't take much for somebody to encourage me that Michael is that person. That Michael is that person. But I'm going to teach the rest of this 25 minutes that Michael is not that person. I just want you to see that because this is how nebulous the teaching is on angels and demons because it all comes from this these areas and we don't have much more like i would love for there being an appendix in the back of my bible that was inspired and that answered all my questions about angels and demons it's not there i've looked all right so so we have to take it just the way it is now before i go further i've got to wrap this up before i go further any questions about this? Those things that we need to understand that we can't defeat being a person on our own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not even, the, not even another angel could do it on his own. Well, he could, but it took him 21 days, and then Michael showed up to help. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is, and this is... That, that's a good point. I don't have time to flesh it all out, Robin, but you're absolutely right. So th this, um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and spiritual forces, wickedness, all, you know. So absolutely, this, we need Jesus to rescue us, whether it's Michael or not. <laughs> We need Jesus to rescue us. That's what we need. We need Jesus. And so, um, th that, yeah, absolutely. That, that's the implication of this. And, and, and to remind us that we really are talking about a real war. It's not an imaginary thing that we're a part of. There really is a battle going on. Um, I don't know if it's as intricate as like, anybody read back in the 80s or 90s, This Present Darkness? that book. All right. I don't know if it's that intricate. He made a whole big to do about his name was Frank Peretti. It's a good book, but it, I don't know if that's right or not. It seems like it's not, um, but it may be. So we just don't have all these answers. And I know y'all would like to talk about angels and demons forever because everybody likes to talk about it, but we just don't have that much. There's just not that much written in, in Scripture. Here's what I believe. If you put your trust in Jesus, if you pray to the Lord, he'll make things happen whether he uses angels or not. And if he does, awesome. If he doesn't, awesome. Because we've got a God who works for us. We're not to worship angels. We're not to pray to angels. We're not to look for angels. We're not to, you know, any of that. Those things aren't, you know... If, if we each have a guardian angel or not, it doesn't matter. We have God. So whether he uses guardian angels or whether he doesn't use guardian angels, it doesn't matter. Not one bit. What God does is what God does, and we can trust him. Does that make sense? All right, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Let's keep moving. So chapter 11, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings are going to arise in Persia. Then a fourth will gain far more riches than all of them. As soon as he becomes strong through his riches, he will arouse the whole empire against the realm of Greece. And a mighty king will arise, and he will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. All right, so from that point on, what, what we just did is we see these different uh, visions in there. So he starts, he begins with Persia, verse 2. Uh, ver verse 2 is about Persia. Verses 3 and 4 concerning Greece. And remember, this is the movement of these, these big empires at the end. Um, th then verses 5 through 20 is Egypt and, uh, and Syria. Let me ask you this question and see how many of you are paying attention. Where do Egypt and Syria come from in this case? The Middle East, that's Syria, absolutely. They came from the Greek Empire. Remember I told you the Greek Empire split up in four different, 
four different other smaller empires. So you go from Greece in verse 4 to concerning Egypt and Syria. And it's from the Syrian section of this empire that Antiochus IV comes, that little horn, that blasphemous one. Remember, he's the one that went into the temple in Jerusalem and killed a pig on the altar. All right, so he's the one, he's the very first one that brings about the abomination of, de of desolation. Its very first one is Antiochus Epiphanes. So that's who that is. So we have him in verses 21 to 35. Uh, as we go through verse 11, this is, all, this is the way this vision is unfolding. So it's go, this succession of kings that God is showing to Daniel that shows how things are going to lead to the end. Remember, this is an encouragement that God's not finished with his people. And so we get to Antiochus Epiphanes in verse 35. Let me read 35 to you of Daniel 11 and then into 36. Some of those who have insight will fall. That is, some yours may, may say some of those with wisdom will fall, or the wise ones. Those are followers of the one true God. And it mentions those throughout. So some of those will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time, because it is still to come at the appointed time. So there's going to be constant struggle until the end time. That would be the biggest duh statement that you and I could ever know. Of course there's going to be struggle, but remember, he's, he's, he's encouraging Daniel not to lose heart. So when Daniel sees, and then when those who follow after Daniel sees bad things happen, they should recognize, don't lose heart. I'm still going to take this. To, even, if, even if you see Christians, believers, in this case, Jewish followers of Yahweh, you see them fall, don't lose heart. God is still at work. Everybody with me so far? That's the end of the discussion of Antiochus Epiphanes. So everything that happens from verse 21 to verse 35, Antiochus Epiphanes did. It happened. And so if you remember those people who thought that this was written after Antiochus Epiphanes, because no, they, they wouldn't account for prophecy, um, they have a problem with verse 36. Because if they make all this about Antiochus Epiphanes, we have things starting in verse 36 that Antiochus Epiphanes did not do. He didn't do these things. And so then they're in trouble. I believe it was written by Daniel in the 6th century, long before Antiochus Epiphanes, that this is accurate prophecy. And that's why the transition from 35 to 36. Because in 36, we start talking about the man of abomination, the man of, de uh, the man of uh, evil, the Antichrist. Listen to what it says. Then the king will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god, and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods, and he will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. But instead he will honor a god of fortresses, a god whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. He will take action against the strongest of fortresses. With the help of a foreign god, he will give great honor to those who acknowledge him and will cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for a price." At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. He will also enter the beautiful land, that is Palestine, or the Holy Land, and many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, and Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape, but he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt." and Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. But rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. This is the end of the end, the end times. The signal for that, by the way, is in verse 35 some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end 
time. So that's the key that we have that ver ver verse 36 picks up and begins to speak about the end time. And then verse 12, I mean, chapter 12, verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise, and there will become, be a time of distress such as never occurred since. There was a nation until that time, and at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. What book? The book of life. That's right. And so... Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. That is the res resurrection in the final day. And so we see the final day come. And then he says, as for you, Daniel, conceal these words, seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others were standing. One on, these are two other angels, one on this bank of the river and the other on that bank. And one of them said to the man dressed in linen, there's the man dressed in linen again who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. This is the promise. By the way, there are some who believe, I, I don't have an opinion, there are some who believe that this, this scroll that is concealed that Daniel rolls up and conceals is the scroll that is opened in Revelation, um, in in chapter five of the book of Revelation. Um, I don't I don't know that it has to be. I, in fact, I believe that scroll is a little different, but I don't really have an opinion. I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> and there, there's a lot of this that is just whatever, not because it's not important, because I, I don't know it. Like I, I and if if somebody tells you they know it. They, they're getting it from somewhere else. It's, it, it's not because you've heard it. You read the scripture. I just read it to you. That's what we have. And so we have to deal with it. Uh, as to the person of Michael, you see him come back. Uh, this idea of Michael arising is, is uh, significant in my mind. I don't know what to make of it. Um, this is why I struggle with the person of Michael. Um, it's just different. He's spoken of differently than any of the other angels. And um, it, it makes me pause. And, and I've already confessed that I could be convinced, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, John Gill makes a good argument. Dr. Gray made a good argument. Um, I, there are other, other believers that probably have, and I haven't read it. Um, it's got nothing to do with what the Jehovah's Witnesses say, but I just don't know. I don't know. Yes, sir. Yeah, the man in linen, right. And that almost seems like a different distinction right there. Well, yeah, there, it wouldn't be the only place in Scripture that Jesus is spoken of in, in kind of side by side in different places. Ezekiel does it, um, and then in, um, in the book of Revelation it's done again. So it wouldn't be the only place, but you're right. I mean, there, there, there is something there. There, there is some distinction there. Um, uh, e, the, the best way I can, if I were defending it, if I, and I'm, I may sound like I am, I'm just defending the possibility of it. I'm not defending it, if that makes sense. But um, it, it would be like Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, we see him one way, and then we see him another way, and... Um, and then it's hidden again. I mean, then it's, although I, I've often wondered, I guess his clothes were still all bleached out when he came down, <laughs> down the mountain. I don't, it didn't say, but I guess they were. But, um, so I just don't have an answer. You're, you are a absolutely right to identify that as a distinction, but I don't know what it means. I don't know the impact of it. Mysteries. Yeah, they are. And uh, he said mysteries, and they are. There are things that we just don't know. And it's possible that we don't know them because God in some ways is unknowable. And so um, the only reason why we know God is he's revealed himself to us, but all we know about him is what he has chosen to reveal about himself to us, which is not everything. Our minds, our senses, our humanness can't comprehend all of the person of God. It would, it, it's just impossible. The creature can't know the creator completely. 
We can know what he tells us about him. And by the way, I think that for all eternity, we'll get to know him better. Like, we'll know more of him. But I don't think even in, in the light of eternity, we won't know all of, because we just, we're not God. We can't, we just can't wrap our minds around all of that. It's like this. Okay, I want y'all to do this. This is a little exercise. I've done this since I was a little kid. All right, think of eternity. Okay, now add 10,000 years to it, and now know that it's just started. And then add it again, and then multiply it by three, and then know it's still not ended. I mean, that's, so that's the closest that I can get to comprehend God, is to try to comprehend eternity, and we can't do that either. I mean, it's just, it's timeless. It, it, it's, so, that's the book of Daniel. Isn't it pretty exciting? You have another question. Ask it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So um, the she said it's by him who lives forever. Um, him capital H. The reason why it's a capital H is because it says him who lives forever. And there's only one who lives forever. It is God. So certainly it is God. Um, so, um, so this man dressed in linen is swearing by the, by the Lord. Um, that there, there is, there seems to be a distinction, but there doesn't have to be again, just in the same way it, um, so Daniel is seeing this vision. So let's say that, let's just say that the man in linen is not pre-incarnate Christ. He's just an angel, not <laughs> just an angel. He's just an angel. Um, so he sees this angel. Uh, and so the angel swears by him who lives forever, um, probably said Yahweh. That's probably what was said, not him who lives forever. And this was Daniel's way of, of encapsulating that. But let's just say he used those words, by him who lives forever. This is another extension of encouragement from this being to Daniel to let him know that he's on his side. Because who does Daniel worship? He who lives forever. But that, so, so, yeah, that, so, that, so let's say now that this man is in linen is pre-incarnate Christ, and he swears to him, it, it's for the same purpose, exact same purpose. Daniel, so, so we know more about Jesus than Daniel knew. Y'all know that, right? I mean, we know more about everything about God than Daniel knew. Y'all think about that. And that's because that's the way that revelation works. God has now fully revealed himself in whom? His son, Jesus. The reason why we know the fullness of God is because it was, re that was that's Hebrews chapter 1, because it was revealed in Jesus. So Daniel didn't have that frame of reference. So he's just telling you what he sees. We are looking back into it and and trying to piece this thing together, but knowing the fullness of who Jesus is and who God is and the way that Father, Son, Spirit are one God, yet three persons, we get all that because of the fullness of revelation. Daniel wouldn't have gotten all that. Um, he just didn't have that fullness of, of the revelation. And so that's why I can say what I do about Scripture, because we have the fullness. I'm, I'm reading back through the lens of the Lord Jesus. It's also why we, we try to say, because I believe absolutely that the Holy Spirit and the Son and the Father were all active in the Old Testament. Absolutely, because God doesn't change. But they just, they didn't, they hadn't been shown that yet. It wasn't until Jesus took on human flesh and walked around with us. Joshua came close. Um, I saw one with a sword, sword drawn, and I said, who are you? Are you for us or against us? For us or our enemies? He said, neither. But as the captain of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Notice the captain of the army of the Lord. That means he was an archangel, the leader of the angels, captain of the army of the Lord. So who was it? Oh, who knows? I think it was, I think it was pre-incarnate Christ. May not have been. But I do know who is in charge of the angels. Jesus is. Ultimately, he is the ultimate archangel, not as a created angel, 
if you're watching this at home, not as a created angel. <laughs> I just, I got to be careful. But he is the ruler of all the angels. By the way, that's what the word Lord Sabaoth means. Yahweh Sabaoth. Yahweh, the Lord, the one true God, the ruler of the hosts, of the hosts, Sabaoth. The hosts are who? The hosts of heaven? The angels. The Lord is the ruler of the angels. So ultimately, that's where it goes. Are there, are there lesser angels who are rulers? I would imagine that's how you organize stuff. But uh, unless they're Baptist, and then they all think they're equal. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's a joke. But uh, maybe a poorly timed one. But anyway, right, what other questions? That's a, the, the, I, hope, I hope I haven't messed anybody up. I, I want to be really clear about what the Bible says compared to what we try to figure out about what the Bible says. And those two are often different. The Bible is absolutely true. My interpretation of it, especially when it stops being clear, is not necessarily true. It's, it's we try to figure it out. Now, I know some pastors and some Bible teachers will tell you they've got it all figured out. But there is an old Hebrew word for that. It's called hogwash. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I, th I can't remember who it was. Uh, Chuck Kelly, who used to be the president of, of New Orleans Seminary, he used to say there's an old Hebrew word for that, bakar, bakar, which means hogwash. <laughs> so anyway, all right. Any other questions? Thank you all for being here. We are finished with Daniel. We'll pick up next week. I, 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 let me figure out what we're going to do next week. I may, I may do a little bit more um, stuff on angels, or I may just keep moving. We may just keep moving. I think we've exhausted it today. So God bless you. Have a great day. <laughs>